This is Jack Donovan, author of The Way of Men, and you are listening to Start the World. I am joined today by Ian Strimbeck from Rune Nation LLC. That is Rune, R-U-N-E, Nation LLC. Rune is in the Younger and Elder Futhark. Uh, I looked on his website yesterday, and his slogan is Problem Solving and Confidence Building Through Education. And he uh, teaches handgun, carbine, unarmed combat, and edged weapons. And he also has remote coaching, which seems pretty neat. Uh, I think we've talked about that before. Absolutely. Um, but anyway, you can find him at runenationllc.com and at runenationllc on Instagram. Uh, welcome to the show, Ian. Thanks for having me on, Jack. I appreciate it. Cool, cool. All right, so we've done a little sidebar conversation about what we're going to talk about uh, today. But uh, can you, to begin with, can you give uh, people a little bit of a introduction to who you are and what you do? Sure. So my name is Ian Strimek. As Jack had said, I'm the owner and founder of uh, Rune Nation. Uh, basically, we are a um, consulting and education company that uh, spec or is specified directly in the context of more or less creating better and stronger individuals. Uh, so my philosophy as to how I teach is that it's not just about the gun or the blade or the, the combatives or the medical knowledge or the verbal acuity or even having basic athleticism. It's kind of the overall encompassing uh, con, uh, concept of it all. So uh, not just focusing on on one aspect and more or less becoming a jack of all trades and more or less a master of none. Uh, because if you want to become a master in something, more or less it's uh, becoming focused on that one specific topic and diving all the way in while unfortunately not being able to be well-rounded. Um, so, you know, a lot of other companies out there in, in the space that I do teach just firearms, which is all well and good, but um, I believe that it's much more than that. And uh, through that, um, I'm able to reach out to uh, law-abiding citizens in my classes. Uh, I have uh, military personnel sometimes as well, and uh, law enforcement. So I travel all across the country uh, doing that. Uh, as of uh, today, I have uh, 25 classes already scheduled for uh, this coming 2020 season. And, uh, you know, to get to where I am today, uh, basically from 2006, 2010, I spent some time in the Marine Corps, uh, more or less specifically in the uh, infantry uh, context. So I spent, uh, or should I say, I uh, held every role in an infantry fire team from a team leader, Grenadier Point Man, and a saw gunner. So I spent four years doing that. After I left the military in 2010, I immediately used my GI Bill, went to college, uh, got my bachelor's in communication with a concentration in journalism and a minor in psychology. While I was doing that, I also worked for a locally based exec protection firm in the greater Boston area. So we uh, were in charge of protecting uh, celebrities, VIPs, uh, visiting international dignitaries such as the Dalai Lama, where we worked um, with the um, uh, Dip Diplomatic Security Services, the Army CID, and obviously the Boston Police as well. And, uh, you know, spent some time working with celebrities such as, uh, you know, uh, Keith Richards from the Rolling Stones. Uh, while I was still doing that, I also um, worked, uh, let's say, in less than desirable bars and less than desirable areas of Boston, less than desirable times. So I kind of saw the normalcy of everyday criminal interaction, how violence, how uh, quickly it happens and how ferociously it more or less happens. And that kind of uh, spurted an idea into my mind as to how I can utilize this to help others out. And that's where I first started getting my feet wet, more or less teaching uh, very, very basic uh, firearms knowledge. Uh, if, if the listeners aren't, aren't uh, too knowledgeable about that, basically in the state of Massachusetts, uh, <laughs> firearms laws more specifically are very, um, strict and it's very difficult to obtain um, a license to carry or even to own a firearm in the state of Massachusetts. So in the beginning I taught the very basic classes for individuals in order to go and get their uh, license to carry and uh, from there I basically did that for about seven years uh, working under various individuals as their cadre, as their instructor until I finally decided that 
I want to do it um, on my terms under what I view as a priority. And that's where I kind of left my full-time job at the time, started my company. And here we are today, almost three years later. So. Cool. I didn't realize it'd only been like three years. I feel like you've been doing this forever. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I've been, I've been kind of teaching like when I still had a full-time job, I still taught, but it was kind of only on the weekends and when I had time, but I had, you know, done that off and on probably since about 2012. So. Okay. Okay. That makes a little more mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right. So, uh, when we talked about this earlier, we said, uh, you said you wanted to talk, uh, more about mindset. Absolutely. And, uh, so what, what things, uh, you know, interest you in that area? Um, I'm just more or less interested in, you know, I, I try to seek out as much knowledge, knowledge as I can daily about, um, the ability for the average human to be able to persevere in difficult times, whether it be physically or mentally or all of the above. Um, I, I just find it fascinating with, um, how much or how resilient the, the human is once this is all right up here, because, um, you know, the, the body more or less physically, uh, will quit way before the mind does. But obviously if you don't have that grit, that will, that tenacity, that mental tenacity, um, then in my opinion, it's all null and void. You know, I've seen it firsthand where, you know, simply in, in training or more specifically, you know, when I was in boot camp years ago, seeing, you know, the stereotypical, you know, bodybuilder kid in high school that played, you know, varsity football and he's fallen out of runs or quitting and, you know, getting separated out, even he didn't make it through boot camp because he wasn't right up here versus the kid that looks like he would, you know, get blown away in a windstorm, 130 pounds soaking wet. And he was able to persevere regardless of physical attributes. So do physical attributes help? Absolutely. You know, like no, like it's never a bad thing to be strong as, as you and I both know. Right. Uh, but if, but in my opinion, uh, if it's not right up here and in the heart, um, which I kind of believe are definitely one and the same in regards to the, like I said, the ability to persevere and, and push through, if that's not right, then it's, you've already given up on yourself. You know, something as simple as, and I give this example in my classes all the time, is, you know, let's say you're going to the gym, looking to bust out a PR for your deadlift, you approach the bar and you're like, oh, my back hurts, you know, I'm hungover, I didn't get enough sleep last night, whatever it may be, you, you're probably going to, you, you're going to grip that bar, but I doubt you're going to get it more than an inch off the floor, just because you're already mentally setting yourself up for failure versus the individual who approaches the bar and it's like, all right, I know I need to push through this. It's going to be difficult. I accept that this is going to be painful. I accept that I'm not going to give myself an option for an out for this. And more or less, those individuals usually push through and are able to get that bar fully off the ground. Um, obviously, you know, with prior training, you know, no average layman's going to go into the gym, put 400 on bar and just be able to rip it. Um, you know, it's about that person that continually trains as well. Uh, but even the well-trained person, if they're not right with the proper mindset, they start going into those dark areas of mind and start thinking about, um, you know, things such as regret or um, starting to be self-conscious about themselves or taking in and allowing the opinions of others to more or less create a poison inside their mind. I, I really believe that a lot of times people um, unfortunately allow the opinions of others, even if it's their family, um, their, their, their loved ones, their friends that they continually, for whatever reason, surround themselves with. Um, I, I do believe that sometimes people allow them those, those preconceived notions or those opinions uh, to, to steer the ship of their lives, their destiny, their path, whatever terminology you want to use. So, okay. What do you, what would you say are some of the uh, best ways to take control of the ship? Uh, well, first off, obviously not allowing negative opinions to um, affect what you believe in, uh, whether it be a faith belief, whether that be a belief, uh, just, something as simply as what you, your, your hobby is. Obviously, 
you know, if, if your hobby is breaking the cars and performing illegal activity, that's probably not the, probably not the, <laughs> the best passion to go down, but you know, like, um, <laughs> I'm following my dream. <laughs> yeah. I'm following my dream of being a carjacker. No, um, mm-hmm. something like, you know, I've had in the past people jokingly say, you know, say that I'm obsessed because I wake up at four in the morning and I work out every single morning, not every single, but you know, five days a week. I'm, I'm very consistent with my workout very consistent with uh, doing jujitsu, like I do jujitsu Monday through Thursday for four days in a row. And then I also work out five, five days a week. So the average person would view that as obsessed um, when in reality, that's just what I view as a priority. So not allowing people to affect your belief in, you know, these, these passions that are helpful to you, that are positive to you. Um, just because those people more or less are potentially feeling insecure about themselves uh, or you're not paying enough attention to them. Um, so, uh, you know, you, you see it all the time with, you know, an individual that gets a significant other. And now the friend feels left out because they're spending more time with the, the significant other. And, you know, they, they start bad talking the significant other, whatever it may be, because they feel left out, they feel abandoned whatever it is. So it may be that your, your friend, your loved ones feels abandoned because it's a new hobby that may f- make you feel better about yourself may be potentially growing you positively. They may be, they may feel left out and insecure because of that. But regardless, obviously having a, you know, a healthy balance, if you do have a s- significant other, right, you shouldn't be, you know, there's definitely a balance between what you view as a hobby and what's important to you and be able to balance those two things out. And, you know, an, another way that you can, again be on the right path to that is getting into a habit or getting into consistency or having some type of regime Um, a lot of people I know just kind of you know just wake up whenever in the morning and you know they go to work and then they come home and they they don't really have anything that they're certain or they're set on Uh, versus me like you know I have to know that I have to wake up early enough in the morning to work out and then uh, go and bring my, my kids to school. So I have to allow myself enough time because in my mind, I'm not going to finish the workout after I come back and drop them off. I have to get this done in the morning before I leave. I don't give myself an hour so maybe that means that I have to shorten means that, um, you know, I just have to follow because it kind of pushes myself. From. Now, realistically, could I work out after I come back? Yeah, I, absolutely. But the, the issue I see with a lot of people is they always give themselves an out when they really didn't need one to begin with. And once you give yourself an out, then, you know, like, oh, you know, I'll finish the work. I want to get home from work and then you get home from work and, you know, you start getting distracted on your phone or on a phone call or, you know, watching a show and you're like, ah, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to it tomorrow morning. And that just gets into a habit of never finishing that task because you give yourself an out. So in, in my mind, what, what I make myself believe is I don't have an option to finish after I, you know, drop the kids off or whatever. So that may be viewed as an extreme to most people, but that's what helps me be able to push through and maintain a consistent habit of things. And that will inevitably push you past your preconceived notions and again, push through that potential plateau that you're in and, you know, continually on that path to greatness. Yeah. You know, I, as I was listening to you say that, uh, a friend of mine, uh, his name's Bo and, uh, he always was very firm about like, I I don't compare myself to normal people. And uh, yeah. that, it's a great little slogan uh, just yeah. Uh, because, yeah, normal people will say, oh, you're obsessed and you're doing this and uh, oh, you do too much and you should not do this. Well, it's because they're not achieving anything and that's why they're normal. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. You know, like, you know, people who are, you know, I would love to be around people who are busier all the time who make me feel like I'm a loser. You know, like, I'm like <laughs> yeah. Jack, what are you doing? Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> what, what did you do all day? You know, uh, I mean, because there are people who are just going and going and going and going all day long. And, uh, you know, those, you know, I still get, I I get, I get a reasonable amount of stuff done, but, uh, you know, obviously there are people who are are getting a lot more done. And uh, that's, that's who you want to compare yourself to, if anyone, 
you know, like, oh, yeah. you know, I could be, I could be doing a lot better. Not like, well, you know, yeah, you could take a, you could be like a little more relaxed about everything and not, you know, like whatever, but you're not, you know, that's why people are coming to you for advice and not, you know, the person who's telling you to relax, yeah. you know, because yeah. you're doing more stuff. Yeah. The, uh, you know, the, the idea or the concept of, of being average or normal or mediocre, like honestly makes me like uncomfortable just even thinking about it. <laughs> like, and, and again, that's not to say that I don't take time off and, you know, I, you know, don't take time for myself. Like this morning, uh, twice a week, I do a little yoga thing that, you know, a little 30 minute yoga that I do, you know, from, from YouTube, it's free. You know, people think that you need to pay money, go to, to a yoga studio. I did that for about a year, but in my opinion, like after about six months, like you can literally just, or even after a couple of sessions, if you have the basic understanding of the movements down and, and mobility wise, you can just do it for free on, on the internet. And I feel like taking time out for yourself as well and not being go, go, go. Like, you know, I have plenty of friends that are like that as well, that are constantly going, you know, fueling their entire body with just like, uh, no offense, I, I know you're drinking monsters there, but they're literally just <laughs> Rockstar. Drinking, this know, is gallons. sponsored by Rockstar. Yeah. No, no, no. I yeah, wish it was. Gallons of, uh, <laughs> yeah, gallons of monsters or rock stars or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And like, that's even too much of an extreme for me because yeah. I feel that I know I would get burnt out, but they, they, they enjoy that type of go, go, go. But being able to take even out time for yourself and, but still becoming better because of it. Um, because again, if it's not right up here, um, it, it's, it's not going to do too well. And, and another thing going off of the average and normal mediocre is I, when uh, with my kids, I don't allow the word I can't in the house. Cause you know, kids, I can't do this. I can't do that. My, you know, there's no such thing as can't. It's just, it's going to be difficult. And, and, I, and I feel like once people admit that, you know, I can't do this, then, then it's all over. They've already admitted failure and they're already accepting it. So taking out certain terminology, like being normal, being average and settling for that, or taking out terminology like I can't, like, no, you, you, you can, it just may take longer for you. You may have a longer learning curve to get there depending on your current abilities whether physically mentally uh, but it is possible just the the issue is um, aggressively over comparing yourself to others um, like like you were just talking about now obviously you should in some instances uh, you know uh, that's why it's always good to surround yourself with others that are better than you whether it be physically or uh, business-wise or whatever it is, because obviously, if you're, as it's been said in the past, if you're the best in the group, you've already screwed up. Right. Um, so constantly being able to surround yourself with those that are more intelligent, stronger, whatever it is, it will constantly push you. Um, and, and obviously, it, it's good to, I'd say, slightly compare yourself, be like, oh, wow, you know, um, you know, Jack's doing really good at this or whatever it may be, but um, comparing yourself in a sense that you don't want to go and complete it because like, oh, you know, Jack's, you know, so much stronger than me. I don't even know why I'm even trying to do this lift or whatever it is. That's where it starts to be the danger. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, like I, you know, I spend a lot of time hanging out with like power lifters and, and so forth. Yeah. And I don't have any yeah. desire to be one of them. So yeah. I'm not, you know, like I, yeah, could I make all the sacrifices necessary to get to that level where I could, you know, be pulling like 700 and like squatting 600 yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. I believe that that's, a, that's possible for me to do that, but I don't want any of those adaptations and I don't want uh, yeah. all the, all the things that would require to make that happen. I, oh, I yeah. didn't want that. So I don't feel bad about it, but then you can still be inspired by those guys and their commitment to what they're doing and then apply that to whatever you're doing. So, but yeah, you, but you don't have to, you can compare yourself to other people, but not, it, it's not doesn't have to be direct it's not like apples to apples yeah and, and you know a, another good example is you know say when i go to uh jujitsu um you know i'm all you, the school that, that we're at that, that that i go to is, is small um and it's, but it's been around for a while um and you know there's a certain uh, the same group has been going there pretty much since i moved up here almost six years ago and they're all higher belts like purples browns got a couple 
Uh, obviously, the owner is a black belt. There's not a black belt that goes there. So very obviously uh, upper class skill wise on the mats. Um, and it's always interesting to me because, you know, I try my best, even though it fails miserably, but I don't ever get emotionally distraught when I get submitted because I understand that they've been doing it longer than me. They have more skills than I am. And they're, they're literally, I'm not going to say there's no way to get to where they are, but again, it would take a huge sacrifice. I'd have to probably train twice a day six days a week, give up, you know, my business, go to every competition and compete, then maybe I would get up to their skill level. Um, but in the sense of where I am at, I'm okay with being submitted because I emotionally accept that they have a higher skill level than I am. They've been doing it longer than I am, but I still push myself. I, I might be like, oh, today I got, <laughs> I got a uh, tie control on my black belt for 10 seconds. Maybe I'll get 20 seconds next time, you know, right, like, right, but right. I'm okay with that. Like I don't get distraught or, um, or overwhelmed. You know, if I am in a dominant position, I get swept and now I'm in the, uh, you know, uh, you know, um, in guard or whatever it may be. Cause again, I accept that they've been doing it longer than I am. They, they have just more time on the map than I ever will. Yeah. I mean, well, that's just how jujitsu is. I mean, that's, that's, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I, I actually rolled with a buddy of mine who I might have on the podcast eventually uh, down in Bend. He's actually a doctor and he uh, he's also a brown belt and he's bigger than me and stronger than me. Uh, so he's just this wow. Hulk of a man and he's yeah, a brown belt yeah. and he's a doctor. And so, and I went and he was teaching the class and, and so I went and I knew I was going to end up rolling with him cause you know, he's a friend of mine. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he was the guy who I came down to see. So, you know, I'm like, you just know mentally, like, this is going to be a horrible experience. Yeah. And, uh, you know, like, this is going to be like rolling with me only worse and knowing what I'm doing, you know, <laughs> yeah. you know, so, yeah. but it was, it was cool. And what you learn out of that is like, uh, I'm, I'm pretty good at getting out of arm bars because everyone wants to yeah. arm bar me all the time. And so like, well, uh, we got big arms, we got big arms. We gotta go yeah. And, and, <laughs> and I'm, I'm more confident about how keeping them out there, yeah, you yeah. know, cause I can, I have yeah, the yeah. strength. So like yeah, everyone, so, so I'm getting real good at rolling out of arm bars. Like that's kind of, a, <laughs> and so he got me in an arm bar and I like got out of it. He's like, he's like, nice, <laughs> you know? And, yeah. and then, and then, you know, like put me in a Kimura like five seconds later, but you know, it was, yeah, yeah it was, uh, you know, that's what you get out of it. That's the positive thing. You're like, Oh, okay. I, I impressed him with that thing. You know, you're not going to, yeah. I had no, no thought in my mind that I was going to submit him. <laughs> you know? Yeah. 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 As the, uh, as a mentor of mine, Paul Sharp had said in the past, he's a black belt through, uh, um, the SPG crew. Um, yeah. I follow him. I think on, on Instagram. Yeah. yeah. Um, he needed to get comfortable being uncomfortable. Yeah. More yeah. or less. And you, and you know, this doesn't apply to, to jujitsu, but really anywhere in life, but you have to just jump into the void where that void be of your first time back in the gym since high school, whether it be the void of stepping on the mats for the first time and having no idea how it's going to go, whether it be in the void of coming to an actual professional instruction of firearms in a class where you're around people you don't know, or whether it be taking the void of quitting your job and going and doing something that you're passionate about. And, and I feel like people's uh, uh, lack of emotional ability to control their fear uh, doesn't allow them to take that leap. They're always thinking of the what ifs. Well, what if this happens? What if that happens? Next thing you know, it's 10 years later and you're still quantifying these all hypotheticals that you've ever, that you've never actually put into practice. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, it's, that's absolutely, I mean, so uh, let's see, we, we were going to talk about, I think uh, we were talking about mindset. Uh, we, we, we joked a little bit about stoicism. Mm-hmm. And, and that kind of feeds into the emotional control of actually going into the void and like, uh, you know, but, uh, you know, what's your, what's your take? Uh, we talked about a little bit about it, about the uh, stoicism. Yeah. So I've been, I've been pretty much on, I would say the stoicism bandwagon, probably I'd say since, uh, maybe 2015, 2016. Mm -hmm. So n nothing, you know, you know, I've been in, you know, I, I've been doing a long time, but I feel 
long enough that it's had a significant positive impact, whether it be in my personal life or my business or all of the above. Um, and, you know, as, as you and I talked about previously, uh, any extreme of anything is bad, whether you're talking about, you know, religion, politics, whatever it is, any extreme. So, you know, the extreme side of stoicism is where you really don't care about anything, right? And you know, you know it, it makes it sound like a very uh, nihilistic, you know, view on the world where it's like nothing matters. I can't put any emotion to anything. And, yeah, it you know, becomes, it's, it's, it's like, uh, you know, like, I used to hang out with people who used to call themselves misanthropes, which is kind of, you know, like kind of a whatever thing to call yourself. Oh, that's a great yeah, to take yeah. pride in, right? And yeah, uh, yeah. I, I hate all of humanity. No, I hate it more than you do. And uh, it's I, I see the same thing in people that like uh, call themselves uh, sto stoic sometimes. There's a little bit of a race to be like, I'm more unaffected by the world than you are. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I, yeah. I, I don't care, but nothing, nothing really impacts me, I, you know, and yeah the the problem with that you know, it just becomes a, a little pretentious and yeah. uh the, and and also the problem with that for me personally is just that that uh at a certain point well who are you and what do you care about because if nothing affects yeah. you and you're not nothing's a problem then like you don't you're just like an amoeba or something you don't care about anything you're just uh, yeah, you yeah, just yeah. exist you know and that's i don't think that's what most of the stoics were actually talking about but some people no. actually try and take it take it that that direction and it's unproductive yeah i i look at stoicism more or less as especially from from the broad concept is not allowing what we were talking about the the, the opinions of people to um a, affect you or more or less the an outside stimulus or an outside source that doesn't directly affect how you provide for yourself your family um, your loved ones, if, if, if they aren't doing that directly, then why do you allow it to emotionally control you? You know, something as simple as, um, and this is a good example because I am cursed. I'm pretty sure like a gypsy cursed me flying one time because I have the worst luck with flying. Like my flight either gets delayed or, uh, we had, like the, the, the last time I flew out, I, I, I did a, uh, a week long class for the air force out in Oklahoma. And when I was flying back, um, they had to turn around right to take off because there was something wrong with the I instruments in the cockpit. So we had to land, do you, you know, D plane, chain everything over, find a plane, like some simple stuff like that. I'm like, of course this happens to me, but the, in this context, the idea of like the the stereotypical airplane or passenger goer at the airport that's screaming at the customer service attendant because their flight was canceled, um, you know, it, it's not Susie's fault that the, the 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 plane's engine had a malfunction or it's a thunderstorm outside and they're not allowed to take off. Like it's not her fault. So why are you just bombarding her? Which she she already probably hates her life as it is because she oh, has this totally. horrible job as a custom service attendant working for, for Delta or American Airlines. And here you are all, you know, high and mighty because your flight got canceled. Like, so did everybody else behind you. So why are you spewing this, this anger and this emotion at this person who literally has nothing to do why your flight is canceled? Yeah, no, dude, that, that, I think that that's even just maturity. And understanding how mm -hmm. the world works uh, it, yeah. is that, it, I mean, I've, you know, I don't work now, obviously I just do this, but uh, I've, I've had uh, like 37 jobs in my life and, and uh, yeah. I've had all those crappy jobs, you know, like I've, yeah. I've worked at it. I, I've been the dude who gives the like Hickory Farms, like snacks in the mall, like during Christmas, <laughs> you know, like I've done like every, I've done all kinds of horrible, like degrading uh, shit. And, I'm trying to imagine this right now. Jack <laughs> well, it was not the Jack Donovan you see before you. It was a, yeah. uh, an earlier incarnation. But uh, it's it, uh, no. I mean, I mean. So I've done all that, and those people, you know, if you've done those jobs, and that's what's annoying is the people who are yelling at those people are also people who have inane jobs a lot of times. Yeah. But uh, yeah. and so they're just they're they're perpetuating the cycle. But uh, yeah, I mean, like right now, I'm mad. There's a yeah, like. This, this really got under my skin is that Oregon just banned plastic bags. And so now I have to get the, yep. the mommy bags and fucking go to the grocery <laughs> store. And I hate yep. that. And it feels like a purse. Mm -hmm. And so like, I, it, 
I ordered black ones off of Amazon because I'm like, well, just, just I'm make not, it metal. Yeah, I'm gonna try and make this as cool as possible and whatever. I mean, it, my my non-solar perspective was that I was gonna get like you know like like NRA bags or like just something that would offend the people that wanted this to happen. <laughs> you know, you know, maybe pictures of abortions on it. I don't know, but <laughs> it, it's uh just something horrible. But that's shitty, and I'm not. That that's not how I yeah. go through life. I don't even like offensive T-shirts. I'm like, oh, yeah. I'm I'm gonna totally offend grandma at the grocery store. You know, it's, yeah. it's a juvenile perspective. But oh, uh, you know, but okay. So and everybody's trying to figure out this new bag situation at the grocery stores. Well, you know, some people were yelling at the fucking cashiers and and whatever. And yeah, and, yeah, man. It's like, do you think the cashier made that decision? It's like an Oregon state law. There's just some person yeah. who's paid twelve dollars an hour to deal with this problem right now. Like, stop. That's yeah. not them. You know, like, stop, don't yell at the, don't yell at the, the, not even the messenger. You know, you know, it's not. You know, that's. Yeah. I think just yeah, understanding the, that in life makes you a lot more mature. Yeah, and 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 probably one one of the you know there did like probably the the two slogans not so maybe a motto i don't know a terminology that that we that you would use within the stoicism realm that that i kind of try to embody every day um is one that i actually uh we're right here so it says memento mori on it right. and uh one, one of my buddies a uh jujitsu purple belt actually made these um he's a cancer so a multiple uh not multiple cancer, but basically had it, went into remission, had it again, and fought it again. Um, he he made these. So no, those aren't familiar. Memento Mori is just basically the, obviously there's different ways to interpret it, but how I interpret it is just to li live every day to the fullest and to accept that death is, you know, going to happen at some point. Now, when it happens, you know, ultimately is, isn't up to you, you know. Um, I could walk outside my house thing and hit by a car, you know, a uh, meteor could come, fall out of the sky like there's all these possibilities you know all these crazy possibilities but the reality is that you kind of have to live every day to the to the fullest and more or less like i said understand that um death is a very real possibility and and, and that's the one thing that's kind of guaranteed in life you know we we're, we're you know if you live awesome you're living but at some point we're all going to die and again embracing the memento mori on the extreme side, again, going into that nihilistic idea where nothing matters, we're all going to die, you know, why do I even do anything? Um, and on the back of it as well, you have, you know, the rose, you know, the wilting rose, the skull, and obviously the hourglass as well to, to represent, you know, everything has, has an end, more or less. Um, so that was one that I, I embrace, you know, whether it be through my business, through what I do, like I wake up every day. And again, I kind of put into my mind that, you know, today's possibly the day that my business go under, you know, maybe, you know, someone tries to throw slander, you know, online and I have to fight that or I have to fight the fires or maybe just something catastrophic happens. And I have to go back to go doing a regular job. And that's probably one of my greatest drivers um, because fear can actually be used as a positive, in my opinion. Fear can be used as a negative, as in not allowing you to say jump into the void, but also, you know, in my position where I'm at, the fear is the driver that pushes me to excel every day and not remain stagnant. Um, because the last thing I want to do is tell my kids or have my kids say to their friends, like, yeah, my dad did own business and traveled all around to these things, but he had to quit it and go back to a nine to five like that. That is what drives me to push every day. And then the other one I embrace through the uh, stoicism idea is um, uh, the, basically I, the idea is to um, accept the kind of accept the the position or the moment um, that you're in. It's called a morphati. And actually Nietzsche was the one who actually transcended. Um, because I think the Stoics weren't the first one. The Stoics didn't make a morphati. That was Nietzsche's interpretation of what you got out of it was to um just to embrace faith um that you know in in in, in my opinion like we, we do do have direct uh power to control where we go in life but i also feel like sometimes things are just put in our way that i i still you know can't can't really put to words like 
say if I didn't move up here at the time to New Hampshire to the frame time frame where I did, I wouldn't have gotten a job where I wouldn't have met my wife, where I wouldn't have been able to be in a position where we're both in a position where we can support each other and I can leave my job and now I can live my passion. So if I, you know, say waited a month or I never moved up here that, you know, I have no idea where that would have put me. Um, so just to, to embrace fate and, and to accept it, whether it be the good or the bad, you know, something as simple as a couple months ago, I was rushing to get the kids out of the school. I backed out of the garage and I completely ripped the side view mirror <laughs> off of my truck. And I literally bought the thing. I think it was less than a month old. I, I just got, I just got it, you know, nice, uh, Toyota Tacoma completely backed down, ripped it right off mirror smash. And I'm just like, all right, well, I guess I got to shell some money to fix it. Like I could have been mad and screamed and made a scene with the kids in the car, but I'm like, well, it is what it is. I can't go back and fix it. So we'll, we got to figure out a solution for it. Yeah. 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 The, the I'm actually uh, listening right now to a biography of Nietzsche called uh, I am dynamite. And yeah. uh, it's, it's really good. Cause it, it fills in a lot of the details. Obviously I've read, you know, I've, about their eternal return and, and, uh, and more fuzzy. And, uh, it's, uh, it's interesting, like watching him in his life go through trying to figure that out and getting to the point where he's like writing his diary, like, yes, I'm going to say yes to everything. And I want to be, I yeah. want to be positive about everything yeah. and say, and say that, you know, whatever happened, you know, the, the idea, you know, the idea that he's talking about with this eternal return is that, you know, like it, live your life in such a way that you would, you would have to keep living it over and over again. It, like yeah. in the exact same way, like Groundhog's Day, basically. Yeah. And, uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and I feel the same way. I mean, uh, there's, there's a lot of things. My dad often said that. And I, I went through a period where I was like, eh, if you don't regret that, he's like, you know, there's no point in regretting things because you did what you did with based on the information you had at the time. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and I was like, I don't know. You know, you haven't really lived much life if you don't have some regrets, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and I, you know, I, I certainly have some regrets, but uh, at the same time, you know, all the choices I made, you know, if I would have done something different, you know, I probably wouldn't have written the way of men if I had had a family at that yeah. time, you know, or I wouldn't yeah. have, there's other things that I wouldn't have done, you know, uh, you know, it, you know, like I've put, you know, gotten into some crazy situations and been in, in some weird places and whatever. And, and, uh, but I've, I have some cool experiences that other people, yeah. have, you know, yeah, <laughs> you know? and, uh, and, uh, you know, it's like, uh, there's some things that I've spent some years trying to dig myself away from because of it. But, uh, at the same time, you know, like that, I have that experience and other people don't. And, uh, I've, I've learned a lot from it. I mean, it, you know, in, in sense of like, uh, a lot of people don't know this, but like I, it, when I went to school in uh, New York City, I was in the nightclub scene, mm -hmm. and uh, that was I was part of that in in the '90s, and uh, so I've I've seen way how far the rabbit hole goes, you know. Like I've been to the very end of it, and uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, like I've I, I've been in VIP rooms with people having sex and people playing Nintendo and people, you know, like, it, it, like all kinds of stuff happening. Uh, that's basically the the end of where American culture is going now. Like I feel like yeah. I've already seen it, and mm -hmm. uh, and you know, it was all the you know it was all kinds of drag queens and transgender people and all that kind of stuff that was already happening then. You know, like there. Yeah. And and so like you know I feel like I've already seen the end. And then, uh, you know, to have that experience is good because I, I can kind of reference it when I'm talking about things and, and understanding where that goes. And it's not just, you know, I had some dude in, in a forum and this is where I learn uh, emotional control because I should never be talking in forums. Uh, but I was forums, you know, I, I, well, forums for, and the comments on YouTube are like the pit of humanity that no, that's Twitter. Uh, okay. <laughs> that, that, that's Twitter. Twitter is an anti-cosmic hysteria machine, but uh, <laughs> but uh, the the, uh, uh, the but you, YouTube comments are a close second. Uh, I I don't even allow those. But and and I like for I actually wish forms can be really productive or really not productive. But uh, it was just a Facebook thing, and I just got sucked into a comment thread, and I was 
you know, that's when I have to remind myself to be solar. I'm like, why am I talking to this person? What am I, what am I doing? This is a waste of my time. But uh, it was just funny because it was about something. Uh, and uh, the guy had basically, assumed, because I had made some kind of conservative comments, yeah. he had, he had uh, made the assumption, I think, that I was just kind of like this guy who had never done anything or been anywhere or maybe you know has only ever read like the american rifleman and the bible you know yeah. and uh you know have no experience of the world and, and i'm like you have no idea <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, like he was saying i was narrow-minded and yeah. and, and i'm like you know it's i'm like you don't know who you're talking to at all like i i've i've seen the far end of where you think you're going you know yeah and uh so it's you know Again, it's like that. Maybe that wasn't the produ most productive thing to be to do in my life at that time, but uh, I, I I get something out of it. And, uh, oh yeah, so. no. Fa Facebook memories are a great way to realize how much of an idiot you were in 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 the past. You know, want to talk about loving that. your fate? I love that I was <laughs> born early enough that my childhood isn't on Facebook. That yeah, that that, yeah. that is that yeah. is something. You know, if I had if I had a God to thank. In that way, I would think out every day that my yeah. juvenilia is not on the internet, yeah. you know, because I was yeah. retarded when I was 20, you know. Yeah, there, uh, was a lot of, there was a lot of uh, screening that as I got older, a lot of going back and hitting that delete button for sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I spent many um, hours, yeah. <laughs> so so I, I, this, is a pro, this is a question I have for you. Okay. And I, I'm sure you've talked about it in the past, and it'll probably be great for people are just tuning in now is is your when you say saying solar is that kind of and and, and i'm not going to say that it's your version of stoicism i'm sure it's completely different but is that your interpretation of i don't know your emotional growth emotional control and like uh what is being solar to you well uh, it's it's something that i'm developing you know even still um yep. Uh, actually, I'm working on a book right now, and that it'll probably be finished as an idea in, in the book. But uh, basically, it is to a certain extent my my version of stoicism and emotional control. But just the idea of the sun, I think, is such a great metaphor. Absolutely. I can get, and I can get really crazy with this because uh, I think that when man makes a fire, he, he imit imitates the sun. And he creates light in the world around him and light creates order and that's the campfire and then that's the perimeter and that's the whole fucking concept that I can get really nerdy about. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, it's everything we do is kind of an imitation of the sun. And that's kind of the, the original patriarchy idea. And then it, the, it became the original concept of God, which is uh, Dias Vater and uh, the original Sky Father. And, yeah. uh, and so we're idealizing this thing that creates light and truth and becomes the center of warmth and a uh, center of gravity in your life. Like, what do you want to be in your household? Like yeah. you want to be a center of light and truth and warmth. And basically it all revolves around you and you're creating the sustenance for all of that. And you you have an orbit yeah. basically around you and any man who's, who's becoming really what he is, uh, is, is really trying to become in, in sense his own son. In in, in 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 you know yeah. sun obviously but uh, he's becoming yeah. his own uh, becomes confusing in that sense but he's becoming a son in the world around him yeah and and it's also and uh, you know a, a friend of mine who uh, you know added into this he said you know sometimes the sun blinds you you know like the sun can be blinding it's going to do what it's going to do without you you know mm -hmm. and, and and that it's on its own path and that that goes back into a lot of things that we're talking about uh, right now. It's like, don't let other people change. Don't be manipulated by all these other influences in your life. You know, stay on, you're in your own path, you know? Yeah. Of course, the sun is actually just staying in, in place. Everything's coming around it. But uh, that's, we didn't know that as primitive man. Uh, but, uh, you know, the sun basically, in, in all the metaphors and, and so forth about the sun, it you know, like the sun is, is, you know, going through the sky and then it's disappearing and it goes into darkness. And there's a lot of myths where the sun actually goes into darkness. And that's actually where I think the staying solar thing really comes in. It's like the sun actually has to go through darkness 
and it, yeah. it is a source of light in the middle of darkness all mm -hmm. the time and it remains a source of light and uh and so i think that that's really what uh, one of the ideas that uh, i gravitate to in that you know because you're going to go through some shit in your life and you're going to be surrounded by darkness and chaos and so forth oh no absolutely you know that's you know it's something that i try that i have the I have the ability, I feel like I have the ability to do now just because of the lifestyle that I live. Like when I did have a day job, I was very pessimistic. I was more pessimistic. I was angry uh, just because I, you know, I had a, had a, had a job that was a job. I hated it. Was not passionate about it, but it provided for the house, for the family. So it was in necessary I, and i hate to say sacrifice because i know and i've seen what in my opinion what true sacrifice is and some people i think bass have been starting to bastardize the use of the word sacrifice right. uh, but it was a period of my life that was necessary in order to um, sustain the life that i currently live now uh, but now that i'm in a position where i get to do what i love to do every day um, and i make my own schedule and i basically make the choices that could either make or break the ability to provide for my family because of how of a drastic of a uh, leadership role that is i think it also has calmed me and centered me in a sense where um, i am more positive uh, not just around my family and my loved ones but um, also even to the the general public um, like, uh, you know, one thing that my wife and I really want to do for a long time uh, was to match, uh, something that's, and it's going to sound silly, but to match the tip, uh, when, when we went out to eat one time and it was a, it, it was a pretty, uh, good, decent bill that we had and we, we matched the tip, um, and as we were walking out, the guy came over and, you know, he, it was busy that day. Like it was super packed. Guy comes over and looks at the tip and you just see his eyeballs just like open up. And it was just a, it was a real, I don't know, it's real fulfilling emotion to uh, be able to be in a position where you can do something as simple as that. And just to possibly, you know, maybe I made that guy say, maybe he just got out of a relationship or his mom died or something just really bad happened in his life and he had to put a, his mask on for the day to come to work and you now can I help you, you know, you know, to do the whole uh, thing as a good server does. And then here I come along, you know, him expecting just another probably shitty tip because we all know how some people can tip and, yeah. Uh, yeah. and, you know, I possibly may have changed that guy's maybe day or in an extreme sense maybe i train uh, possibly altered his perspective on how the world works it's something as simple as just in eliciting that potential happiness in, in, in his life and and again if you veer on this extreme side of just like creating happiness and everything then you start to you know start believing uh, as an extreme optimist where there's no bad guys in the world and everything is happy go lucky and rainbows and unicorn and you know there's a middle ground. Do I believe that there are good people in the world? Sure. But I also believe that, you know, there's people out there that are going to take every advantage possible to get what they want to want out of you, whether it be through violence, whether it be through, um, you know, just being conniving and sneaky. Um, so, you know, I, I truly feel like you can never really let your guard down, obviously outside of your loved ones and in your circle. Uh, but, I also feel like you shouldn't be pessimistic in a sense that you just create this aura of just negativity and hate around you, I guess. Yeah. You know, and, uh, when you do that, uh, and you create that, uh, that's what you attract as well. Yeah. So you attract people, uh, to your orbit, uh, who are angry all the time. And yeah, and, you know, I mean, I think I did that a little bit with, you know, I mean, because like, I wrote The Way of Men when I was driving a truck, you know, and, <laughs> and, I, and I liked that job compared to other ones. I mean, I actually liked uh, you know, yeah. being a delivery guy because you were like kind of free all day and you didn't have anybody over your back the whole time. And that's kind of why I like doing that. Except but, for uh, heavy sacks of shit. 
Yeah, yeah, but that was fine. I and that's that's yeah. easy, you know. Like that's yeah. that's that's fun yeah. stuff, you know. That's not like that's not like conflict and having someone screaming at you, you know. Like that's yeah, yeah. that's just like fun work, and uh, yeah. so. But that's definitely one of those things that you know, like you know, I was at a more angry place, and you can kind of read through that and see and. and and it still and it still makes me angry when I look back and look at it. You know, it's like just stuff like uh, there's some passages in it. You know, if, if you're a working class dude, you're basically like half. You know, a lot of your life is like here's a, here's a cup of my own warm urine, sec- secretary. You know, yeah. like that's that's what that life is, and it's yeah. degrading and it's vile, and mm-hmm. uh, and uh, you know it makes you angry. And 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 I have to remember that a lot of guys are dealing with that still every day. But yeah. then maybe that's our job. Like we've gotten out of that. That's our job to be more positive, and we can kind of throw that positivity out there, and uh, yeah, it be it, like you said, like the the tip or whatever, like a, a source of light in their world that's not all angry and, and upset. But yeah, if you're if you're angry all the time, you definitely attract those those people, and uh, you know, there's a, a, the dude that I know wrote wrote a, a blog post about energy and uh uh in terms of attracting like low energy people and low energy mm-hmm. people are kind of people who always want to stay angry yeah and uh and they kind of and and you know if you can be a leader of low low energy people that means that you make them happy in being angry but they're never going to stop being angry because yeah it's it's it, it it's just an echo chamber of negativity yeah. Right. You know, the, yeah. The, the people just hang around, they just bitch about, oh, my work, oh, you know, this, or, you know, politics, or sports, or negative, negative, negative. Then it's just, like I said, it's to just everybody empowering each other on how negative they can be. You know, it's, it, it's literally a pissing contest of how, how much angrier the next person can be about something. Yeah. Like, uh, oh, you think that's some bullshit? Well, listen to this fucking bullshit. You know, like, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that's it. it yeah. It, you know, it's the old, whatever cliche a misery loves company and uh mm-hmm. you know but uh yeah it, it's 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 definitely something you don't want to perpetuate but and, and on that vein i actually mentioned uh earlier and this is kind of something i'm trying to do in each of these episodes um who do you think because i like to men to lift each other up because mm-hmm. uh you know you have this thing out in the world where like you know have, you have women and women are really good at like at least maybe they don't actually mean it, but lifting each other up in the world, like, oh, you, you did, you went to the gym once. You're amazing. You're a, you're a badass. You're a hero. And men are a little bit more like they're, they either do that. And then they, 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 you can't, they're difficult to respect because they're doing it too much or they're not, yeah. they, they're so afraid of giving another dude a compliment uh, yeah. that, that, you know, they they actually, it ends up being kind of negative. Uh, yeah. So who do you think, who do you think has a great message out there right now? Like who, who do, who's, who's inspiring you? Uh, in regards to <laughs> inspiring me, um, I would say I really don't, to, to be honest, I really don't have one specific, uh, specific person. It, it's more or less, I, I guess the, the, the group of people that I surround myself with that are also teachers in the, in the, in the firearm space or self-defense space or whatever terminology you want to use um, just to see uh, them being successful and uh, fulfilling their passion and and their literal business and um, you know, being able to see them enjoy time out, uh, with their family and connecting with them and, and just kind of embracing all that positivity. That's what, that's what kind of uh, uh, pushes me. And if anything, um, as cliche as it is, I'd say um, what, what pushes me or what motivates me is to, uh, is to have, my kids in interested in what I'm doing and uh, for, for, for them to uh, kind of share the same passions a, as what I do. Uh, like for example, over Christmas, um, my, 
my wife and I, we got jujitsu mats for the basement. So my basement is now completely self-sustainable where I have an Apple TV, um, a monitor, a pull-out couch and bed, a wood stove, a full workout gym and squat rack and lifting platform. And now I have jujitsu mats that basically they go off the edge or the end of the lifting platform. Um, a friend of mine was selling some, so I, I bought um, their legitimate, like good quality jujitsu mats. So now I can uh, teach my kids in in the basement or when they're acting out, you know, I tell them that if you keep acting out like that, you have to spend 60 seconds in side control with me. So that's kind of <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's great. Yeah. So, uh, and, and for them to be motivated enough, like, uh, you know, for, for me to, cause obviously when I'm not traveling, um, I work off, uh, from home and honestly, most of the time, like it's probably one of the few times I'm actually on my laptop. I usually do most of my work off my phone, whether it be, uh, answering emails or, um, responding to DMS or stuff of that nature. It's all off my phone. Um, so for them to come out of doing with it, whatever they're doing and to come up to me and, see that I'm busy, but still ask like, Hey dad, you want to come down to, 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 to the basement so, so we can do some jujitsu or working out or whatever it may be that, that kind of pushes me um, in, in a sense to uh, know that I can never let that fire go. Uh, because if I let that fire go, it's, they're going to end up like every other stereotypical kid in today's society, which as we all know, isn't too great. Uh, so that kind of instills in me, uh, the ability to um, both persevere business wise and and physical wise like I never want to be the stereotypical dad with the you know embrace and uh, embrace the idea and joke about the dad bod um, like that that will never that will <laughs> that is not like I will die before that happens right and right. And, and again like there's plenty of people out, out there that are way stronger than me faster than me but I feel like for the for the average like like we talked about in the very beginning for for the average person I feel like I'm I, I I'm pretty confident in, in my abilities, um, and as I've talked about in other posts and I'm sure I'm sure I picked up the concept from one of your books is uh, you know realistically I could never step foot into a gym and just eat like shit for the rest of my life and I'd still be moderately okay. I'd probably be unhealthy, maybe have diabetes, but I wouldn't die. Like there's no need for me to constantly push myself in jujitsu um, to, you know, do like, you know, f five, eight minute rounds or just roll my black belt with no clock for 45 minutes. There's no reason for me to beat out the gym five days a week. There's no reason really for me to even go to the range and practice with a gun. Like the chances of me, you know, realistically wise having to use that throughout my lifetime is pretty slim to none, but I just don't, again, like I talked about earlier, I don't give myself an option for anything, but holding myself to those standards, not just for myself, but now because I have uh, my kids who look up to me as a role model. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Yeah. To, 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 before we uh, wrap up here, um, we had talked a little bit about meditation and yes. uh, I, I'm always interested in what other people do, how they, how did you, uh, Perfect. How, how did you start out? with that like what, what are the resources that you started with and then yeah. where are you now absolutely um so meditation i feel is extremely and well, i just want to preface this as, as, as like a as a, as a uh, forward here i feel like meditation is extremely vital for um for everybody i don't care whether you have a nine to five or your business owner whether you're healthy unhealthy male female i, I don't care mental health is is key and, and again, um, I understand that there's plenty of, there's some people out there that do literally have a chemical imbalance in their brain where they are, you know, they have to take, um, you know, certain things like SSRIs because they are, you know, literally prescribed from their doctor as having depression. But I feel like if more people also took into consideration their actual mental health and um, didn't just rely on medications or um, you know, what's expected in say society, which is going to the doctors and being prescribed literal crap you're putting in your body, there'd be a lot more successful and happier individuals out there. And 
I think people don't take meditation seriously enough because it doesn't fit into their lifestyle. People think meditation, they think of the earth. <laughs> we call them earthy crunchies up by us because we're, where I live, I'm kind of in the border of Vermont. And Vermont is like the stereotypes, right? If anybody's listening, it's from Vermont. You know what I'm talking about. You got the, uh, the, the, the Subaru uh, uh, Forester. You got uh, everybody smells like patchouli and they wear the Birkenstocks and they uh, have a bag of granola on them at all times. Pretty much, <laughs> part of the, like, pretty much what like Portland is probably. Uh, yeah, but, or it used to be. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, p- people think meditate. They think yoga. They think all this this, this hippy dippy stuff. Uh, but in reality, you know, you don't have to spend all day doing it. Something simple as maybe taking ten minutes out of your day of your morning and just focus on you. And what I found out what worked best for me in the beginning was to focus on breath work. And I've been in the process of um, utilizing deliberate breath work for almost four years now at this point. And where I first started was an individual named Wim Hof. A lot of people are familiar with him. If not, uh, regardless regardless of the... (laughs) of the outlet, I know vices, we all know what vices, especially in the very masculine space, not too hot, but they do have a very good documentary on Wim Hof. Um, it's about 45 minutes long. And basically he was a guy from Holland, um, fought through depression. And uh, he basically found a way to use breath work as well as cold water uh, immersion um, to help individuals out in both the mental state and just overall. So I started off doing his stuff where Basically, it, he would just tell you to breathe. It's basically hypoxic type breathing. Uh, you're basically trying to inhale and exhale as fast as you can, therefore creating that kind of inner fire um, that, um, you know, it's been talked about in cultures for thousands of years. Um, so you, uh, you perceive you're warm and then you immediately go into whether it be a cold shower or in my case, I have a river down by me. So I did a cold water immersion dip in the river. There's a video on my YouTube. It was 17 degree air temperature outside. And I stayed there for about four minutes. Um, I would have done longer, honestly, but the first thing to go, regardless of how well you're doing this technique, your appendages. So the current was strong. And I'm like, I'm not going to get stuck down the river because I'm there by myself. I have my truck behind the video camera, Peter on full blast with the video camera rolling i'm like i'm not getting stuck down river so i hate so i literally get out and i feel like i just nubs like someone just chopped off my hands like no feeling whatsoever and honestly the people ask like oh that must have been hard sitting there it really wasn't once you've done this enough and you accept that i am purposely sitting in this water under my choice um it, the difficult part was actually thawing out like if you think about how cold you've ever been as a kid when you were not wearing proper stuff and your hands are cold, those pins and needles, think of that times like a hundred. Like it was bad. Uh, but I, I did do it not out of a surely certain reason. I just want to see if I could do it. Like, again, we talked about jumping into that void. Like, can I actually sit in literally water that is warmer than the air temperature outside? Can I actually do that? Um, so I did the Wim Hof stuff for about three years. And now this past year, I started out interesting in the why. I'm always interested in the why, whether it be from what I teach, what I always give my students the why as to why I'm teaching them certain techniques or whatever it may be. So the the good thing about Wim is that he's good about the explanation, not the explanation, but well, yeah, I'd say the explanation, but he's just as good as a character because he gets the information out there. Everybody knows who Wim Hof is, but he doesn't really go into the why as to why he's using a certain type of breathing. So another individual um, who was one of his, instructors you, you learned under whim is an individual named brian mckenzie brian uh was pretty much in the uh started out as one of the original og plank owners of crossfit way back in 0304 and uh very I- interesting guy um completely covering tattoos came from like the punk rock scene kind of remind me of a uh, mark twice in, 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 in a sense more or less right. and uh he basically took what Wim did and then like looked into the why behind the, the, the breath work portion. And um, I was very adamant about doing the cold wall, cold shower every morning. And after listening what Brian said, cause he's been on a lot of podcasts, plenty of good information out there in regards to him. 
Uh, but he said, and again, going into any extreme is a bad thing. So always doing cold showers, especially after workout, probably isn't the best thing because you're constricting, again, all those blood vessels where your muscles need all that good nutrition, that good blood flow to them. So he veers on the, on the, on the side of doing both cold water immersion, but also then doing, you know, hot, um, you know going to like a sauna or um, right. a jacuzzi or whatever it is. So um, being able to constrict and then expand the, the, the veins in, in uh, the parts of your body. So where, where he went to the breath work with that is where Wim just said, just breathe however you're going to breathe. Brian's very specific in nasal only breathing. Mm. which is um, if you look at it, if you look history wise, that's how the human body, human animals designed to breathe is through and out through the nose. The mouth is specifically designed only for communication. Open your mouth like I am right now and putting myself in a sympathetic state, i.e. fight, flight, or freeze versus parasympathetic, which is what I do when I nasal, when I nasal breathe only. Um, so you see it all the time when, 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 when we have a new guy show up to jujitsu, just shows up, he gets on the mat for the free roll, and then a minute rolls by, he has five minutes left on the clock, and he's about to die because he's putting himself in that fight, flight, or freeze. So is it more difficult to relearn? Absolutely. Like you, you're using your nose in a way that you've probably never used in your life. And you've actually looked back thousands of years ago to the skeletal structure of cavemen their nasal passages were actually bigger because they had to have a high aerobic anaerobic ability to hunt, you know, you know, freaking saber tooth tigers across the, the tundra. Now as the humans evolved and we have less of a need to do that, obviously the body naturally evolves and devolves or de de evolutionizes your nasal passages because you don't need to breathe in that manner anymore. But since I've uh, started Brian's method, as well as he, he made an app called State, where basically it has different states for what you're doing for, for the day. Um, so you have one, you, you have a breath protocol you'd use in the morning when you first wake up, it kind of energizes you like a cup of coffee. You have one that you would use to uh, cool down, like after a workout to calm yourself back down. Right. You have one that kind of you'd use for shifting tasks, you know, if you're going from working out to then focusing on writing or whatever you want for that. And then you have one that you would do hypothetically before you go to bed to calm yourself down and put yourself in a good mental state for um, going to sleep. And my app will be different than yours because when you first get it, what's used as a baseline is taking about three or four nasal only inhale. And then at the very top of the inhale, you hit the timer in the app and it measures how long it takes you to get from the top or a full expansion of the lungs to a full decompression and um, compression of, of the lungs. So obviously the longer it takes you, the better CO2 tolerance that you have, which is obviously a good thing, better CO2 tolerance, the, the, the more efficiently you can breathe. Mm -hmm. um, so the average person, the average, if I give this to some person off the street, they, they're, probably gonna, they're probably going to average 20 to 30 seconds. Since I started using this program at the end of September, um, I just redid it yesterday, I'm up to 120 seconds. So literally it takes me two minutes from the top of an inhale to slow down to get a full decompression of my lungs. Um, and because of that, I've seen huge um, changes in my jujitsu, being able to stay more calm, being able to uh, uh, be able to not be out of breath in between rounds staying calm, thinking of how, what technique I'm going to use next, um, staying more calm, um, even uh, uh, working out, uh, be, being able to not be completely out of breath after a Metcon or whatever it may be, um, mm -hmm. and just good mental health-wise. If, if I'm being stressed out, you know, if I'm, if I'm almost late to a flight, I, I can literally do this anywhere. I can get on the flight, do it right there in my seat, you know, if I'm all crazy out because I got to the airport late or whatever it may be, it's you'd be surprised how much something as simple as learning how to breathe properly can significantly not only change your, your mood and your emotion, but also just your aerobic ability. Um, and, and again, that's something that I can do anywhere. I can do that laying in my bed first thing in the morning. I can do that um, on a plane while, while I'm driving um, somewhere. I can just have this clipped on you know, in front of my truck and just, and just have it going. Um, and, you know, I can use that in my 
if I want to take out time to do specific meditation, I can use that same breath protocol as well. But I kind of view my meditation more or less as just taking time out and focusing on am I breathing properly? Uh, because again, if you know how to breathe properly, like breathing is obviously like the the center of everything, right? If I don't know how to breathe properly, I can't work out. I, I'm I'm, I'm going to emotionally freak out. I'm going to be a bad parent. I'm not going to be able to do jujitsu properly. I'm going to freak out and make a bad decision in my business and get freaked out and not go through what I, whatever I'm going to do. So breathing, in my opinion, is, is everything. Um, so that's like a, a huge thing for me is, is taking time out. And, 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 and like I said, for me, that, that takes five to 10 minutes out of my day. It's, I'm not spending like hours doing this. Right, right. Actually, it, it that's interesting. I, uh, when I was doing boxing training a couple of years ago, uh, the coach that I worked with, cause it was more like just traditional American boxing. And yeah. the coach that I worked with was really, really, really intense about nose breathing. Yeah. And, uh, he actually would make us do sprints and the objective, and this is really hard to do while you're sprinting, but, uh, yeah. the objective is to like nose breathe while sprinting. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and if you, cause the, you know, the idea was, you know, if you have a, whatever, two minute round or four minute round and you're sprinting and you can sprint for four minutes, the rest of it's easy. You know, like oh, yeah. if you can get there, if you can, you can sprint for that long, you know, the rest of it's easy and you're used to breathing through your nose. And, and also, uh, as you said, it keeps you more calm. You yeah. Know, it, you know, if, you, if you're not doing the like, <laughs> cause that's, that's when you go to shit. And, uh, yeah. you know, but if you, if you're able to be like, you know, like someone's punching in your face, and you're still like, you know, yeah. you're still like doing it through your nose. It, it's definitely very centering. Absolutely. Know? Yeah. So, so, so for, yeah, for, so for, for my meditation, like mm -hmm. outside of on my phone, like outside of the social media apps I use for my business, I'd say that the state app is like my most used thing. Cause I, I, I do probably about three breath protocols a day. I do one in the morning, I do one after I work out, and then I do one at night. So I, I use that thing pretty frequently. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, I, my, yeah. my practice is, I mean, I, I, I don't meditate every day. I, I do it basically to initiate creativity. So yeah. uh, although, you know, it's funny, everybody, everybody does the cold shower thing, which is fine it, yeah. good for them. Uh, yeah. I'm not, I'm not, like, <laughs> I've done it. I've done, I've done, and I've had to do stuff, you know, just even when I go get, take pictures in waterfalls and they're really cold. Yeah. I'll go. And you do do the thing where you're like, you're freezing for a few minutes and you just accept. I'm like, well, I'm here to get the shot. So it's going to take as long as it's going to take. And then you're fine. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And so I, I've done that as well. But uh, I find, uh, I think before I actually started meditating, uh, my meditation was mostly uh, in hot tubs at 24 hour fitness or at, uh, and I did the, the sauna thing and I really like that. I wish I had access oh, yeah. to one more often. Yeah, Those are too. cool. But, uh, yeah. I, I, I get a lot in the shower. Like, oh, I yeah. think that's always what I, that, the a hot shower actually, like I retitled a book yesterday in the damn shower. Like <laughs> <laughs> I retitled a book. I write on the, the, the shower door window with runes and stuff sometimes yeah, yeah. and make fine runes and all kinds of stuff. Uh, yeah, that's, yeah. that's my, weird creative meditative space that I probably have always done. Uh, and then, uh, you know, now I actually do meditate, uh, you know, but uh, uh, that's you know, something I've always done as well. So it's just interesting to hear what everybody else does, but I'll definitely, uh, I'm kind of interested in what that, that state app does just in terms of, because uh, uh, I've, you know, I've led group meditations and stuff like that. And, they, yeah. and you do, that's, that's what everyone does. You talk about the breath first and that's what, you know, yeah. most guided meditations do is you yeah. get everybody in the same kind of breath state. And, yeah. uh, and that's, that's a really good way to get people on the same page. But uh, yeah, the, uh, the, the, the cold water shower, when you see with the Wim Hof way, I just used to just have a timer and just to see how long I could go. Yeah, yeah. And now, and I got this off a podcast. I was listening about Brian. He said that instead of trying to focus on just the time, focus on the breath work. So you're doing a two for one, you're immersing yourself in cold water, which has its benefits, but you're also focused on your breath. So his, his goal was to see how long it takes you to um, do 10 breaths, just 10 breaths in, in and out through the nose. Um, so my goal for, for a while was to do 10 breaths in 10 minutes in a cold shower. And I was able to do 10 breath, 10 breaths in 10 and a half minutes. So that's basically from the inhale to the exhale, taking just over 
of, of a minute long while again where i live it's all well water so it's in the, in the winter so it's completely frozen water so to be able to so it it keeps it shows you how well you're able to keep your composure obviously while you're in an environment that is inhospitable for the human body right right yeah cool all right well i think that's uh I think that's a good a good amount of time and a lot of good yeah. information there. Uh, is there anything? It'll probably I would say this is going to come out in, in about a month. Uh, you know, two weeks to a month, something like that. Uh, is there anything that you're working on right now that you want to tell people about uh, to check out or send people to? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, for again, like Jack talked about in the beginning, for those you don't follow me. Um, I have both a Facebook and Instagram at Rune Nation LLC for Instagram and just Rune Nation for Facebook. Um, I try to I try to keep as um, as much content on there as possible. I do try to do like a motivational mindset piece every other day. Um, I am passionate about my writing, so I, I try to write as often as I can. Um, that's kind of like my my daily habit is, is is putting or writing down stuff to use for the future. Um, for those you are interested in, in training, for those you um, self-defense guys out, out there, I have, um, you go to RuneNationLC.com, I have my entire course schedule on there. Um, in March, or say at the end of February, I'll be in Arizona. Then in March, I will be in Colorado and um, South Carolina. Um, so basically from February till October, I'll be doing two to three classes a month and all that info is um, on the website. As Jack talked about, I also do remote coaching. So I spurred this idea from my fitness coach, um, my good buddy Marcus. He runs Invinium Athletics over in Tacoma, Washington. Um, he's been doing remote coaching with me for over, shit, almost three years now at this point. And uh, he uses an uh, app called True Coach, and it's a great app because he can upload everything he wants me to do. I upload a bag, he can upload videos, all that. So I took the same idea and did it through firearms. So if a person can't get to a class due to location, like say they're in South Dakota, I'm not going to South Dakota anytime soon to do a class, but they still want good training. Um, a lot of it, a lot of program I put through that is 80% dry fire, 20% live fire. So, um, and it's and specifically designed for you. It's not like a pre-made template. You tell me your goals, how often you can, you know, practice, do some dry fire, how often you can get to the range. Um, and we can customize that specifically for you, your lifestyle, your goals, all that type of stuff. So um, it's something that I haven't seen really done um, too much in this space. And I feel like it has a lot of benefit, again, for those who can't make it to a class or um, just can't uh, financially accrue um, the funds to get to one. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. That sounds really interesting. All right, man. Uh, th uh, thanks, for, thanks for coming on the show. No problem. Awesome.